Last week, thousands gathered at Abu Simbel, one of Egypt's most iconic monuments, where two temples were built on the orders of Ramesses the Great. It's such an important site that it even has its own airfield, and outside of Giza, the distinctive colossi of Ramesses II that form the front of the larger temple is probably one of the most iconic images of ancient Egypt. Witnessed by this reverent crowd, as the sun progressed from the eastern horizon, it sent a shaft of light into the great temple, where three of four divine statues were illuminated. The lit statues are of Ramesses himself, flanked by Amun, the supreme deity of the Egyptian pantheon during Ramesses' time, and Ra Horakhti, the god of kingship, whom the pharaoh was the adopted son and mortal representative of. The statue that is not lit is of the craftsman god Ptah. Now here's where the story of this semi-annual event gets muddied. Give this event a search on your search engine of choice, and you'll find a few things repeated. This is an ancient event, it happens on the 22nd of February and October every year, these being the accession and birthday of Ramesses, and the statue of Ptah is left in darkness because he is the god of darkness. First off, the temples were built so long ago that the dates no longer line up, and even if our calendars agreed, we really don't know when Ramesses' birthday was. Not the day, not the month, and only a pretty good guess on the year. Second, the bizarre asymmetry of the statues, i.e. there are four of them and three are lit up, makes me personally doubt that the Ptah statue was deliberately meant to be left in darkness. Why not have five gods there or put the Ptah statue elsewhere? I'm not sure Ptah is particularly associated with darkness, though I'll admit to not being an expert in his cultic practices. He was, after all, a craftsman and architect, and usually those two activities benefit from light. The most important reason I'm not sure the legacy of the event is perfectly historical is that the temple isn't where it was originally built. And that's a good thing, because if the temples at Abu Simbel were in their original location, they'd be underwater. With the construction of the Aswan High Dam, the geography of Egypt was destined to change. Not only would the vast annual Nile floods cease after a millennia-long, more or less predictable cycle, the lower ground upriver of the dam would become the dam's reservoir. Abu Simbel was built on low ground, I suspect so that the rising sun would indeed illuminate the statues as early in the day as feasible, but it was built at a time when that land wasn't destined to be underwater. In the late 1950s, CE that is, architects the world over began to imagine ways to stop the ancient temples from being flooded. Suggestions included building a protective dam so that the Aswan Reservoir would fill around it, but in the end it was decided that a relocation was the most feasible solution. After an international fundraising campaign, the great work began. Just as the ancients had done, great 20-ton slices of rock were taken and moved, except that the modern Egyptians had cranes. The work was painstaking, because of course this was not raw rock they were moving, and the loss of one of these carved blocks would have been a devastating blow to the conservation effort. Four years later, the temple move was completed. It didn't go far, a couple hundred metres back and a few dozen metres higher up but the original temple was built into a cliff overlooking the Nile, and it was oriented so that twice a year the statue chamber would be illuminated. This wasn't just an effort to save the buildings, but to retain the functional things that were thought to be important to the original builders. So an artificial mountain was built around the temples, so that they could be oriented as close as possible to their original alignment. But this is where my continued scepticism, my sceptarcism, if you will, comes into play. I think all four statues were probably meant to be lit up, and that this has been lost because of a slight misalignment. Now, I don't think that's a crying shame, but the prevalence of the myths surrounding the modern day festival are leading to some very likely historically iffy conclusions. Look, the birthday and accession day thing seems nice, and it's not implausible. You get to pick your accession date, and you can find somewhere along the Nile where this event can take place at the right dates. But I've seen a lot of sources parroting the same few facts, which, while I hate to throw shade, of course, looks a little bit to me like multiple journalistic outlets citing each other, which is a bit of a thing. 
Anyway, next time someone says that Egypt shouldn't be given back Egyptian antiquities because they wouldn't know how to conserve them or protect them or modern Egyptians can't take their ancient heritage seriously, maybe point out the time they picked up a 3,000 year old temple 20 tons at a time and built a mountain to house it in just so their ancestors' gods could keep seeing the sun. Oh, and probably for millions of tourism dollars. Thanks for watching, and thank you for all the solidarity you showed with my last video. As always, hitting that little thumb up is a fantastic way to help my videos get seen by more armchair Egyptologists. The regal colossi that flank the entrance to my temple are my backers at patreon.com slash armchair Egypt. Do have a think about becoming one of them, they're all great, and I think you're great too. Thanks as ever to them, and I promise to keep you all protected from any reservoirs I establish near your homes. Until next time, my fellow armchair Egyptologists, life, prosperity, and health to you all. Thanks for watching. Head over to my channel for more, or click here to see what the YouTube demons think you should watch next. I hope you'll consider subscribing. If you'd like to support and collaborate on the channel with me, go to patreon.com slash armchair Egypt. You can also join my Discord community, there's an invite link in the description.